Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 278, my conversation with podcast producer Travius Lawson. But first, let's talk about our sponsors. Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. Sign up today for your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Yes But Why. You get a free audiobook download as well as access to hundreds of books and podcasts. You know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I haven't been on my Audible app in a while because, you know, back to school and everything was just super crazy and I feel like I'm totally busy all the time. But now that the boy is actually going to be in school and I have like time during the day, I'm whipping that Audible app out and I am listening to some sweet, sweet books and podcasts. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to go through all of my wish list. It's going to happen. You can do it too. Go now to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why to sign up and get your account today. Yes But Why podcast is also brought to you by podcastcadet.com. Podcastcadet.com is the company that my husband Chris and I run to help podcasters. We started our own podcasts about five or six years ago ourselves, and have been trial and error figuring out how to do everything. I mean, Chris is an audio engineer and a genius with reference to the tech side, but like, you know, how do you market? How do you do the recording? How do you make it sound the best? How do you talk to audience members? Stuff like that. We needed to figure it out as we went along the way, and some of this stuff is hard to figure out, so... Since we did the work for ourselves, we just want to help and share our resources with you and introduce you to the people that taught us what to do and kind of just connect podcasters to the resources that they need. We want to be there for you as you're creating your podcast. Mention code YBY20 and get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy. Podcastcadet.com Yes, But Why podcast is also brought to you by True Hemp Science. True Hemp Science is my resource for vegan-friendly whole plant extract CBD oil. Check out TrueHempScience.com for all of their products. There's a lot of different things there, and I think you're going to find something that helps you. I feel like CBD is everywhere these days, but... When you go with True Hemp Science, you really know that it's, you know, a local Austin business and that he's working hard to create these products for you. You know, this isn't like farming it out from someone else and like just selling it to you. Like he's making it and and creating something for you as a healing product. Like the energy of that makes it better. So go to TrueHempScience.com. And get 7% off your order of $50 or more when you use the code YESBUTY7. And you'll get a free packet of CBD edibles with your order. TrueHempScience.com This week on Yes But Why, I feature artist and podcast producer Travius Lawson. In our conversation, Travius and I go deep into the topic of what is art and who can make it. Travius tells me about the evolution of his production company, Always Press Record. Listen in as we chat about the artists that inspire us, from long-dead painters to present-day musicians. I now present to you Yes But Why, episode 278. Travius Lawson reminds us to always press record. Enjoy. Amy Jordan, and this is Yes, But Why Podcast. Yeah. I've noticed as I've gotten older that a lot of people have to have a list of who they are. Mm. And it was like, for me, I didn't really have a list. Cause I was always weird. (laughs) And so like, I never fit in. I was always odd. So it was like more, my list was just like shit that I like to do that. I was just keeping track of. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, I like to act every now and then I'll, I'll go up on a stage. I like hanging out with actors because they like just fucking around. (laughs) And it's like, I'm just being screwy. 
and just sometimes you got to put a wig on, man. Just put a wig on. Yeah, just, just put a wig on. Yeah, like is that <laughs> is that so wrong? Like sometimes you just got to like be somebody else and do something to just I don't know, get rid of that that stress heavy feeling on your life, I think, man. Yeah. I, I I don't think that people really have outlets and they don't know what their outlets are. And so as they get older, they have less and less outlets because they're trying to uh, stay within the confines or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Whether it's expectations, profit, whatever, you know, it's a whole bunch of different things that are placed onto you as you become an adult. Well, I also think that some people have a harder time grasping themselves and who they Mm -hmm. are and what they want out of the world. Mm -hmm. Like what you're saying about like put a wig on and like sometimes you got to play somebody else totally jives with me. I mean, I get it. I am 100% that way. Yes. But I really feel like for some people like just doing the just being themselves is as much work as they can do. Right. Like they just can't see multiple lives. You know what I mean? 90% of the people who are just like the, like are consumed with the waking up and going to sleep of it all. Yeah. And everything in between. Some people like I have a friend named Aaron. He tells me all the time that I, 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 I think too deeply about things. And I was <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> I think too deeply about things. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, you're like sitting there and you're watching this YouTube video and you're over thinking about this and thinking about this and you're talking to me, man. And I've just been sitting here just zoned out on the pictures. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, yeah. cause, cause I, and then that's when I realized that not everybody's doing the same thing when they're not talking. Yeah. Right? Um, and then I read an article where I found out that people don't hear themselves in their, in their head. Like they don't have an inner monologue. And I was yeah. like, well, how do you think through a thought? Like if you're not talking to yourself in your head. And then that's when I realized, well, well, like, oh, wow. So there are people out here where they can't, they can't get to the thought that I'm getting to because they're only consuming, accepting and moving on. Yeah. Like, 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 you know, like you put, you put feed into a goldfish bowl. They're all going to go and then they go back to whatever they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> eat and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, Whatever. deeper analysis, like for instance, of art is yeah. a harder thing to grasp for a lot of people. And you know, yeah. I I will blame I don't know what it was like, you know, in Houston as far as like what arts education was, but I grew up in Boston yeah. and there really yeah. wasn't a lot as far as arts education. They didn't like show you how to look at a painting and they didn't like discuss with you what this guy may have meant when he was painting it or whatnot or or sculptor or whatever. They didn't like talk about it. They talked about it in college because I did go for a theater thing so that there was Mm. a little bit more of the art appreciation part, but they don't teach that to regular people. And I think that people would benefit like in a larger sense in their whole lives. If they thought, if they spent time looking at a painting and thinking not only like, what did this person mean when they made it? And then secondarily, how does it make me feel and how those two things are separate, but together at the same time, then I think could open people's brains to processing more in their lives, right? Like, like you and I talking about, you know, we're watching a YouTube video. You're not Mm -hmm. just watching the music that's being played. You're watching the acting in the video or whatever. Then you're also Mm -hmm. like, oh, the lighting in this is really good. You're thinking about the lighting guy that made it. And then you're also, Mm -hmm. they're like panning. You're like, oh man, the camera that they had to use to do this. Like, you know, so you're like, we're into the larger, how did it get made? Why did it get made? How does it then make me feel? And where you get to appreciate that, but they don't like present that to everyone growing up to say like, hey, this skill is helpful for your life because it helps you have a wider view of discerning the world and looking at it and acknowledging what's going on. I think you're right on there. And I think that the, well, Tyler, the creator, the rapper said that um, it's all about um, exposure and reference points, right? Hmm. So like, a lot of the times we don't all have the same reference points, especially when it comes to art, right? Huh. Art is very intimidating. 
Um, yeah. From an artist's point of view, you got to accept that everything you do is art, good or bad. Art is the the transfer of emotion or perspective onto the canvas or whatever you're doing, right? Like that's art. Like a lot, like when I was making, like, you know, I make t-shirts, right? So like when my t-shirt fell and it messed up the design that I was meticulously putting on there. Well, that's art, man. Let's fuck it. Because that's what happened, right? We yeah. know that, that Leonardo da Vinci was carrying around the Mona Lisa for, they say about five to seven years and he was just carrying it as one of his canvases amongst the canvases. And now it's, you know, Mona Lisa, everybody loves it, but it was like just one of his canvases that he was keeping around. Like we talk about the notebooks and the hard drives and everything else. Yeah. And nobody really knew. And then somebody looked at him and was like, yo man, did you see this background? This background's pretty crazy. <laughs> like, you know, like the lady, she's not really smiling, but you know, that might be cool too. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was like one of those things where in Houston with me growing up, it was very interesting um, because art appreciation, I don't think, I think because we have like a defined nature of art, like we, like everybody says, this is art, this is not art, right? So like sure. it's a little intimidating, right? Me being the weird black kid that I am growing up, right? <laughs> so it was like, when I saw art, I really wanted to know other things like, why did that happen? Why is this so cool? Why is this blurry? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, why not take a picture? What, 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 is, what makes it so hard? Right. And it's all these different things that allow my exploration into art where I was like, okay, that makes more sense. But it was because I went over to the Glassell, the Glassell School of Art, which is down there for all the kids over in Houston. And you get to make pots and, and hang around over at the Museum of Fine Arts. And you got to hang around people who like that stuff, right? Because, like, they tell you cool stories where you're like, man, that's not just a painting. <laughs> that's just as good as a, a random VHS tape that I love, know and love. You know what I mean? It has so much into it to where, like, when I look over at a painting, especially the impressionistic like paintings. Like I'm all about that. Once they told me that um, it was all about how they were taking in the world and that's the reason why it was blurry. I was like, Oh, okay. And then when they were like, Hey, the reason why it's blurry here is because he had astigmatism. And I was like, Oh, I have astigmatism. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have glasses. So he just <laughs> drew it that way. Cause that's how he saw it through his eyeballs. Yeah. That makes total sense to me. And so, like, once you start, like, correlating that, then, like, people will appreciate it. But most people don't. Like, we talk about it all the time. We make podcasts. We put so much effort to it, right? And then at the end, it's like people don't see the art form of it, the art form of the conversation, the pickup, the fact that you don't always have it, um, or the dead space, right? So you just keep going, keep going. And it's like all these different layers. I love the production of it. Like, I love art, man. I love making new art because it's so hard to do it makes something out of nothing and everybody acts like it's easy it's hard to make somebody love it universally but it's easy to make art it's easy yeah you just got to figure out which medium you want to do it right also i feel I like the idea of people liking it or not liking it you're right does not change it being art or not like it and also like we were talking about all these guys, all these painters that we've been talking about, they, nobody liked their stuff when they were around. People were like, this is terrible. Why are you painting that? Painting this guy, that. this guy looks like he's screaming on a bridge guy. What's happening in this photo? Like, why you know, like, he look like that? why, what's happening? Are you okay? Like they're, they were not into it. Right. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. when people listen to the, you know, you have like a friend or like an aunt or something, listen to your podcast and they're like, Oh Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all right. That was good. Um, I mean, I only listened for about 10 minutes, but, you know, it was a good 10 minutes. I really, I liked it. You know, it, it's like, it's not for everybody. You got to find the random people that it is for. And even if it's for nobody but you, it, it is valid. And it is, like, true and necessary. Everybody acts like the, there's... <laughs> This is going to sound bad. There's not an audience for everybody. 
<laughs> right? No. Like everybody's not supposed to be at every single um, playhouse. Everybody's not supposed to be over at every single shindig. Like, there has to be some people who don't get it. And there have to be, like, a few that do. That's my favorite thing is to find a band that I've never, ever heard of before and then just go and, like, protect it. And it's my band until everybody else hears it. And I go, man, y'all ruined the band. <laughs> like, why did everybody have to like it now? We got to go over to, like, this big old festival now to see the band. I don't like that. I want to <laughs> go back to where I just saw you over in the club. I understand that you want more money, <laughs> but it's like the audience was truer. I don't know. I've been watching this uh, band lately called uh, Rainbow. What is it? No, hold on. It's Rainbow Kitty Surprise. Yeah, Rainbow Kitten Surprise. Wow. <laughs> yes, and it is my. It's one of my favorite bands right now. And it's <laughs> how did just, you find it? Because they made this song that was a hit, and um. But it, did it, it just like pop up on your YouTube feed? Like, check this out. Like, how did no, it even? It was. It was a crazy video. I'll send it to you on the Facebook. But it was like <laughs> a crazy video, and it had like a baseline that I could not deny. And I was like, okay. And then like the lead singer is very, very Freddie Mercury ish, but he has like a long grizzly beard, bro. And it's like the basses, he's. He he dresses up in most of the time in heels and and makeup and everything like that. But their second video I ever saw was basically all drag queens in it <laughs> getting ready for the show. It was like it, it was so crazy to me that there was a band like this. That I had no idea that they existed. And then they were on the second album at that. It's um uh, I'm I'm on it right now. Fever pitch. Rainbow Kitten Surprise, Fever Pitch. Fever Pitch is the name this, of the song? Is the name of the song. And I okay. saw it, man, and let me just tell you. <laughs> From then on, I've been on this band. I, I Like, when I'm on the treadmill, I'm over here listening to it. Dude has harmonies. They're over here. It's a little bit of country. It's a little bit of rock and roll. It's a little bit of just outlandish, just queenism, which I love <laughs> on so many levels. And then everybody's a good musician. So I was like, all right. And I've been on it. And then all of a sudden I looked and they just had like this uh, little live performance out in um, Atlanta, Georgia. And there was like all these people who loved them. And I was like, man, how did all these other people know about them? And I had no clue. And I'm supposed to be hip. <laughs> <laughs> But there's so much stuff out there. So I think much. that I, I think what, what you're saying about how some people don't have an audience is, you know, either what they're trying to do isn't fully formed yet or what they're trying to do is for a later generation or whatever. Like people are like, like, I'm sure some of the people listening to Mozart were like, OK, seriously, stop. But Too like um, but at the same time, you know, people most people will find a tiny audience or a enough of an audience, you know, like 25 people is a solid group of people. If they consistently keep listening to you and talk to you and get involved. Right. And, and, but this guy, this band that you connected with, I like the idea that you're like surprised that you didn't know <laughs> them when in fact there are artists and bands and stuff oh, all over the earth. Life. I know everybody. Every country, <laughs> every country got a bunch of bands. It's like whenever I find bands in other countries, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be like, "Man, did you guys know?" It's like, yes, the they're hugely popular in that country that they're in from. That country, so it actually happened. Yeah, like Chris the other day found a guy, and he was like, "Check out this hilarious video." And at first, we thought it was a joke, and then we looked the guy up, and he's like a number one, like a t the top ten artist in Australia, and we were like. He's famous, you know, oh, never heard of him worse. before, but the beautiful, that's the beautiful part about us being fully connected on the internet is that like, we might be, might be to kind of harken back to this idea of like, how are we going to keep our art when it's all on the internet? What if the internet just goes and then like, that's it, right? Right now we are the only generation mm -hmm. that gets to experience all of this, right? It's possible mm -hmm. that the internet could be gone in any in a couple hundred years, right? Or or less than a hundred years, for all yeah. we know. I mean, 
we are even old enough that we were born in a time when there wasn't this technology and now there is right so this is part of our lives maybe we're just the beginning of it and like i said a couple hundred years they got it they can look at everything like man do you know this band from the early 1900s like or whatever like whatever things that they can find but at some point it will go away right and the connectedness won't be there so i'm like just relish in the fact that we can just be like this guy just made a video He's living in Auckland. What? Yeah. I mean, how did these, this, these two making a band, they're in South Africa. How do I even, how did I find them? Like, how did I, my brain in random Texas connect with, and suddenly I'm listening to this whole oeuvre of, you know what I mean? It's great. I love the I just found out that the Bedouin tribes of, of the Sudan, <laughs> as well as other parts of Northern Africa, are where the most experimental uh, guitarists are right now. Really? Yeah. They have a whole genre of guitar music right now that doesn't sound like anything that, like, if I go, hey, man, it's going to be like crazy guitars, you would be like, huh? And I would be like, yes, man, but it's melodic, and they're out in the middle of the desert. Um, What is it? His name is, because, like, man, I've been on it. Because <laughs> I saw this random video, like you know, as we do, yeah, and um, and he was over like, yeah, the, every you got to know about M D O U Mokhtar, Madu Mokhtar, is like basically the Jimi Hendrix of the Southern Su Sudan, and it spawned all these people <laughs> who he looks like a Bedouin man, like he has scarves on. And like they're out in the middle of the desert, and yeah, like there's a concert from Niamey, Niger, in 45 minutes, and it's these dudes in scarves and Bedouin like clothes with electric guitars playing a new form of rock and roll. Wow! And I'm like, how did that happen? Well, it happened because they got electric guitars out in the middle of freaking nowhere. And nobody told them that you don't play music like that. Totally. Totally. And so now it's like all of a sudden there's so many people that play like that because when the person who had the first guitar, because these things still happen in this society where you can be the first to do something. Like, isn't that weird that out of how many times yes. in like human civilization you can be the first to do something? It makes no sense to me. I just watched a true crime documentary and the uh, police chief in Belize was like, yeah, we don't have the ability to check DNA for evidence. There are things that certain groups, certain areas have and certain just don't have because technology is not just like easy to pass around. Same with these electric guitars. I love the idea that you were like, nobody told them this wasn't the way you did it. I like the idea of this limitless art creation Whoa. that like they were so free that they didn't feel the, any constraints of what you have to do. There were no people saying like, oh, man, hey, man, you know, the right way to do it is this. Uh -huh. And they just felt the music and made it happen. And like, that's so beautiful. I always wonder, that's my favorite, like, memories from my music days was, like, when I was on stage and we were making it up as we were going along because we were a jam band. You know, I love Dave Matthews. Man. So <laughs> it's like, I'm a jam band type of dude. But it's like, when I started playing music, it was very much like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you're black. <laughs> like, I know how that sounds, but it's true. Like, uh, like when I first started, like, my mom, she loved, like, R&B and the OJs and Luther Vandross and things like that. Well, I don't sing like Luther Vandross. I'm, I I don't know how. And then all of a sudden I got sick. And um, and when I got sick, we had like basic cable. And the only thing that was on was VH1. And I saw um, Lenny Kravitz, right? Because it was it just happened to be that time when Lenny Kravitz was the absolute shit. <laughs> and he was like, it was Lenny Kravitz, who you in a blowfish? And the Dave Matthews band. Mm -hmm. And I was like, one, who is this Lenny dude? 
with these dreads because back then he had the dreads mm-hmm. and like I was like oh and then I started seeing oh he likes Prince well my my aunt likes Prince okay so that's cool that's how he knows how to play guitar and then they I found out he loves Jimi Hendrix and I was like all right I've heard about this Jimmy dude let me go see what this Jimmy dude is all about and, and I realized like you know he's Hendrix and then I go oh okay so like when I emerged from like being sick and like I'm coming out into the world, I'm, I'm a teenager. My mom bought me a nylon guitar and I started playing music. I can't play music because I had to teach myself, but it's like, you know, I'm over fumbling around. And then like all the black kids were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I'm playing guitar. They were like, black people don't play guitar. And I was like, what do you mean black people don't play guitar? And they were like, black people don't play guitar. Now, you know, a grown ass man, I can say, well, BB King, all the different ones. Like, a lot of black people play guitar. Tons. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> but it's like at that time, um, everybody thought that rapping into the karaoke machine was music. Mm-hmm. So, what I was doing was not music because sure. they, they had never ever thought about it. So, it's like a lot of the times I was just like sitting in the corner, you know, being that guy in the meme who goes, I can play guitar. I can turn this whole party into <laughs> into a sad affair because I could play guitar. And then one day I started playing with other people who like, like I was like, man, you can play good. T- you can play stuff too. He was like, yeah, I can play stuff too. And so like, eventually you get over to a point where like those other bandmates, they will empower you. Right. To take that risk. You know, I'm a singer songwriter. I, like I don't, I write all the lyrics and I sing all the songs, damn it. So it's like, like a lot of that time, it was a lot of fear because once again, art is hard. Art is easy, but art is hard because you got to be able to understand that on one side of the coin of making cool shit, right? It's the other side of the coin where somebody gets to critique it and say that it sucks. Nobody ever tells you that. But that you can't you can't step on stage without somebody being off stage, and that's the thing that I had to learn. Right? Well, it's an it's a, it's an unnatural place, man. Like you are literally stepping up <laughs> into an elevated position amongst everybody to do something. Right? It's unnatural. You know what? There though? is nothing natural about it. I throughout my life, I have always stepped up on stages and spoken to people and been on stage talking and if if i found out anything as i've gone through it's that Mm -hmm. not everybody wants to be on stage like a lot of people most people don't want to be on stage i mean you and i run in circles of creative people so like most of the people we know maybe want to be on stage but like across the board all over the world no like there's a lot of people that just don't have that you know feeling you know i I wanted to say like drive or whatever but it's not what i mean it's something it's like it's like i'm i'm a person who will stand on stage and talk to people that's what i do i have no fear i am full confident when i go up there i know they will all listen to me and i will talk for as much time as you'll let me and some people just aren't they don't want to do that that that's not what they want to do so Yes, art is hard, but the presentational arts, the arts Mm -hmm. where you're going to be on a stage, potentially live in front of people, Mm -hmm. require a certain group, require certain people who have this ability to have no fear. Now, in the case of like a band or like an improv troupe, when you're going up as a group, that makes it easier. There can be one or two people that are like nervous, but they've got their friends with them, so it's okay. You know, it's easier yeah. to do because you're like, don't worry, we're going to go up with you. We're all together. We've got your back. Great. Yeah. When the whole band works together. Yeah, it's great. Everyone's together. One guy could be nervous yeah. and it wouldn't matter because we're all together doing this. But there are people who, like myself, I go up on stage by myself all the time. Mm-hmm. I have no problem with it. It is just sort of like who I am. It's what I want to do. It's like talking to people is exactly like... I'm a, I'm a gal who needs a pulpit. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like there's just some people who are not, not so into that. So while I appreciate this idea that you're presenting that like your, 
taking something when there's so many people that want to do it. I would mm-hmm. venture to say that a lot of people say they want to do it, but they don't, they don't really. Know. Because if That's you funny. make your way up there, it's mm-hmm. not because you beat somebody out or like we're like, forget it, get out of the way, kid. I'm up there first. Mm-hmm. It's because you took the opportunity you were given in that moment and maybe somebody else didn't. Maybe somebody else, they're like, hey, you want to play on the stage? And they're like, mm, I'm not ready. And you're like, I'll do it. No, you're absolutely right. There are opportunities within the the business of the stage. There are opportunities, right? That's auditions, right? That you just happen to be there for, do well in that type of thing. Um, in theater, I was um, I was always a bit player in theater, so like I don't know if I ever got really nervous. I know in in um, like the school band because I played tuba. Like I, I remember they uh, they had everybody after we won our individual medals in BS, right? Uh, they had us go and play in front of the school, right? My mom was late and uh, I had to play with, you know, just in front of everybody in the hall of the mountain king. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, that song. Nice. And so like I was over here playing that song and I was so nervous. Right. And so like that, my hands started shaking, like as I'm going, like I'm like, (laughs) you know what I mean? But it's like, I, I like when it came to the music, I was always so completely nervous, 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 man. Like I did it all. I used to do the eyeliner eyeliner because I was like, man, I'm going to David Bowie this out and go like Ziggy Stardust. I was always trying to be a character a lot of the times because like, I don't know, man, like I I write love songs. There's nothing cool about being a guy asking a girl to love them. I don't care what Julia Roberts says, man. (laughs) Like it's not cool. Um, That's why you you make songs like pour some sugar on me or something like that because that makes you sound cool, but it's like, a lot of the times you're not. And then a lot of the times nobody's listening. That's the thing that got me, right? From the theater, everybody got there. They're all in their seat, you know, like coming up through high school in the theater department. I just thought that's how shows were. But, you know, being out there in the wild, like, you know, like people aren't listening half of the time. If they are, and like, man, I've done deer, dinner theater, dinner performers, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like everybody's there for some other reason why like especially with with me and the music like i'm over like showing you a piece of the heart man a piece just a tiny piece <laughs> right and so it's like at the end i'm over i get off stage you know i do my three seven songs you know whatever it, whatever it was wherever i'm playing you know like you know people go yeah that's good that's cool yeah well, you know and then go about their business and i'm like yo man was there no scouts out there? <laughs> Was there no record label? <laughs> What's the deal? And then and every once in a while, like you get somebody who goes, I don't like, like I have a friend right now who I, uh, the last time I tried to make a song, granted it was a work in progress, but he was like, man, that sounds so bad. It was like every single measure was just grating on my ears. And I was like, damn, wow. Like you didn't even like, like that just flowed off your tongue quite, quite nimbly. Wow. Considering that we just pushed stop. And it was like, and I, and I remember, and I was, I was brought back all the way back to like the insecurity of, of artist mode where it's just like, man, I, it didn't exist an hour ago. Like, this is just an idea of what's going on in my head. And especially for me, because I hear, I hear everything else that I can't play. <laughs> and so it's like, you might hear a demo, but that demo doesn't, isn't what's there. I think in sound bites. So it's like, in my music, there's always like sound bites of movies. So it's like, I can't tell you that, <laughs> like, you know, as I'm doing it, but it makes sense in posts, I guess. <laughs> but it's your process and it's you know you're allowed to make something that maybe one guy doesn't get or multiple p- people don't get i mean y- you know when you're creating stuff you have to decide especially project by project because everything's mm-hmm. different but like you have to decide am i making this for us or am i making this for them right I've, i did a comedy show for years and 
some of the sketches that we wrote were definitely jokes for us and the yeah. audience did not get it and and sometimes they did and it was okay but like sometimes they really didn't <laughs> and we'd yeah. just do something and they'd be like we'd come off stage and they'd be like nobody got that and i was like but you know it was hilarious right and they're like oh no yes it, it was, was. we were great like that was a great sketch right i mean you don't you don't know you have to like seek out a specific audience right so like i wrote the weirdest sketch i ever wrote in my whole life and i submitted it to a festival mm -hmm. and i won the sketch mm -hmm. writing contest why because it was being judged by other comedians like if random people who watched the show were the people who decided mm -hmm. i doubt that I would have won. But my mm. joke was definitely a joke for jokesters. It was like, hey, check out this thing. You know how the structure of a joke works. Well, I'm going to mm. do a bunch of weird stuff and you're going to get it. The regular people in the audience, they might not get it, but I know you'll get it. And that's who the judges are, right? So you write, you create, if you're trying to create for the, for the audience, you have to really know who your audience is. Right. And then once you do, you just write to them. You just talk to them. I'm, I'm very, it's very interesting that you said that because I'm very much um, like my favorite movies are like, you know, I got, I got the Marvel movies, stuff like that. But like, like you're just hanging out with me. You know how it is to hang out with me. Like you never know what might happen 15 minutes from later. It's like, I love the Christopher Guest movies, like This Is Spinal Tap, For Your Consideration, Mighty Wind, like all those where it's just like, this is a movie, y'all. Like this actually is a movie that was financed and done. And like, it's it's hilarious. I still watch Waiting for Government because my, uh, my old theater teacher, Cece Prudhomme, she actually um, said that we needed to all watch this because we would all get it. And we didn't get it at the time because like we were in the school theater. So it wasn't as it wasn't hitting us. But like yeah. now when I watch that as like a dude who's been in the theater and yeah. all that stuff, it is hilarious to oh me. My God. Hilarious. Yes. Yes. And it's like, I love that. I love this is Spinal Tap because I've been that guy on the tour who's gotten lost backstage and we're trying to figure out how to get to the front. I love that stuff. I love the uh the i love uh what's the one for the dogs with the dogs uh best in show best in show best yeah i bet you show. dog people love that i bet you people who do dog shows love that movie because it's about them they are like that's me that's us oh look at how funny it made me watch dog shows right? because of that yeah because yeah. i was just like man that that makes so much sense and so that's what i kind of want to be as because, like, you know, I'm no longer a musician. I'm no longer all that, right? I'm kind of a podcast director. And so it's like, man, well, what am I going to direct? Like, what, what, what do I think is funny? I'm not a naturally funny dude, but I love situations that are funny. And that's kind of what I'm interested in. Is I mean, like, I would beg to differ that you're not a naturally funny person. I think you're a naturally funny person for various reasons. But <laughs> we can defer to whatever you think. <laughs> well, it's like, I have friends who are who can go up on stage and they know the mechanics of a joke and they can make a room laugh. Sure, but that doesn't make them funny. That, but I know some who do, and it's like so. Whenever I try to like try to be funny, it's not funny. <laughs> so I just <laughs> don't. I just don't. But it's it's one of those things where like I I kind of want to. I don't know. Like the more I see it, I just see exactly where you're at. Where like I'm about to make a world for an audience that <laughs> either you get it or you don't, or it might grow, it might not grow. But that's like what I'm interested in. Like right now, I'm watching uh, Letter Kenny on Hulu, hmm. and it's basically um, it was a guy and his best friend, right? A one was over in hockey during you know during his twenties, and the other one was at home. And so basically they had an inside joke between the people who lived in the town that they're all from and like they would just post things. Right. So there's the there's the Hicks, the far, there's the Hicks, the townspeople, the Skeeters, 
and then the hockey players, right? There's only four types of people in this town, and these are their problems. That was the first thing that was on the, the screen, and I was like, huh? And so they just, they have like this rapid fire dialogue way that's uniquely theirs. It has a Canadian accent to it because they're from Alberta, Canada. And they're very, very much, it, it, it reminds me of Texas. It's one of the craziest things to me. It reminds me of a Texas hometown, a small town. But it was like, I was watching them and I was like, man, the, their jokes, the way that they tell jokes, the way that they're performing, it's all uniquely theirs and they got to create it right like once again they got to create it in this small little area where like nobody told them that wasn't funny because it's canada they were like all right <laughs> like we'll at least give you six episodes <laughs> so because you know they're nice they're nicer than the american audience american audience you only got 30 seconds if your cold open doesn't make somebody laugh that's crazy that's crazy I don't think Canadian TV works the same way ours does. Like, it's not like network where, like, you have to pitch an idea to a group of people and then get it made. I think it's, like, independent films. But I like, I could be wrong. Think, I don't know. Well, like, I don't know. I wonder how Kids in the Hall, Shit's Creek, all these different shows that would never, ever make it. Like, I was over here talking about news radio to people the other day, and they, they had never, ever seen news radio. Have you not seen news radio? I've so seen hard, news man. radio. Of like, course. Come on, man. And I'm like, dude, this is so underrated. And they were just like, no, we never, we never ever seen that. Uh, was like, Even Joe Rogan's in news radio. Man, you know what I just found out? He wasn't in the first one. The he first episode? Not. The first episode. It was a whole nother. Uh, oh, yeah. A whole nother handy. Well, but that, okay, news radio days was uh -huh. back when they made one pilot and then brought right. it around and was like, what do you think? You like it? And yeah. so the amount of time from the pilot to making the other ones, sometimes mm -hmm. stuff happens. And yeah, maybe even the actor that was in the first one got another gig. You know what I mean? And he like yeah. couldn't do it. And they were like, yeah. oh, yeah, we got to hire somebody else. Get to central casting right now. You know, I mean, you don't know. It, it was made differently because it was back in the day. So but wait, hold I on. I want to yeah. ask you a question about your... um. I want to ask you a question about like your creation now. So like a second ago, you were like, I'm not a, I'm not a guitarist anymore. I'm not a creator. I just, I'm mm -hmm. just a director. First of all, you can be all the things forever and you don't have to stop. You can take hiatuses from different things and you don't have to never do it again. You're not old enough to like quit everything, but, no. okay. but what I want to mm -hmm. focus on is not how you're trying to stop yourself from doing art, but rather how did you get inspired to become the aggregator of art the way you are now? Like, what happened? What inspired you? Right now, your current artistic venture is finding all these other amazing people and putting them together and then, like, producing this whole channel of, of podcasters and videos and whatnot what yeah. made you want to be that organizer guy and create that kind of stuff? Um, I'm a director because directing, I found out, <laughs> I found out, requires your hands and a little bit of everything. And so for me, it's an elevated position rather than the one skill sets that I used to hone and try to say I mastered, right? So the way that I became a trade a producer, as they call me now, is because uh, it's, it's a nickname that I heard, is that uh, I was the guy who did not get support. And so I always am the extra supportive dude, right? Because a lot of the times I don't, I think that if I would have just had like that really good push, I would be famous doing this or I would be doing that or I would be doing that. So because I never, ever got that push when people asked me for the push, I, I really gave them a genuine one <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. And so when um, it started all with a, a friend of mine, he wanted to emulate like, you know, what many of the group podcasts are within the hip hop realm. I didn't really like it. I, I got in trouble with my wife 
for some of the topics. So it was like, it was already like one of those where it's like, I wasn't really into it. Right. Um, it's very hard to get me onto a podcast now because of that experience, just wow. because we did 27 episodes. And by the time I was done, I hated him. He hated me. <laughs> and we were just like, this wasn't fun at all. But mm. what ended up happening was that because there was four people on there, including me, is that the guy during the second week, uh, DeAndre, who's one of the founders of the company, he actually said, hey, can you help me film my own podcast? Because I want to talk about something different than what we talk about on the Planet Hurt podcast. And I was like, yeah, man, how long do you want to talk? And he said 45 minutes or more. And I was like, all right, we'll do that before we film our episode. And so that's when we started actually having guests that came out that, that would come over to the house, come over to the room that we originally recorded in. And it was him asking for that push that made me start going, okay, well, I will record you. <laughs> and so because I would record them, um, we had to figure out guests, right? And because I, like, you know, at first he did well with the first three, but then I was like, man, we're missing the guests. Let me get, let me call up one of my friends. And so then I got started into the booking realm of it, where it's like I'm booking guests all of a sudden. And not only am I, like, one of the things that we did, which is stupid looking back on it, but it actually changed the game for us, was that um, my love for TV <laughs> made us film everything as we were going through the early stages, right? So, like, the sit-down with DeAndre, which is what the show ended up becoming, had to have intros, outros. Well, that used my graphic design stuff that allowed me to start taking that visual art component that I had and start actually, like, using it. And because I know TV and because I, I look at it and I'm like, all right, well, we need an intro here. We need an outro here. We need a transition here. We need a lower thirds there. And as I kept going to YouTube University, I started learning more and more about lighting <laughs> because at first it was just all the lights that I own. I would turn them all on to 100 <laughs> and like blast everybody out. Um, and then one day, as we were doing like the, the whole sit down with DeAndre, one of our guests, um, I forgot to record him. So I had to have him back. And when I had him have him back again, he was like, well, do you mind doing a podcast for me? And so we started off with the mangrove community, got into activism and all this different stuff because my second person, <laughs> that's what he was into. And then all of a sudden, I was sitting there and like trying to, because what happens with when you start a company like this is that you start upgrading the equipment. Right. And so I, I kept upgrading the equipment and I was like, man, how am I going to make this money back? You know, because it's like, you know, I wasn't I, I've never been balling or anything, but like, you know, I had a little allowance that the wife gave me and it just <laughs> wasn't stretching as much as it was. So I was like, man, I need to bring on more people so that they can pay me to do this and yada, yada, yada. Well, as many entrepreneurs figure out, like you start doing a lot of free stuff. <laughs> and so all of a sudden I had all these people and I'm doing it for free. And then all of a sudden we hit a hundred hours and I was like, wow, we have a hundred hours of content. I remember when we didn't have anything. And then at the end of the first year, we had 352 episodes of podcasts out of 365 days. And I was like, man, I, I just did all of this. I, I, how did I do this? And along those 352, I learned about sound, balancing sound, uh, balancing multiple people within the room, lighting. Um, but one of the things that really changed to where I was like, all right, I can make a film now is that I tried to get a guy to hire my company to do green screen work for his podcast company. And uh, he he listened to my whole pitch. And then at the end, he was like, no, I'm not going to hire you because I hate the, the look of green screen. And I was like, no, that's the only thing that I have that you don't have is that my green screen is better. And so 
I left out of that room and I was just like, you know what, that's just going to be my cornerstone now. <laughs> and so I started figuring out how to make shows where anybody, cause like I have people in different States and whatnot that they would throw up the green screen. We would have techniques to make sure that they all look different, that they were all great and whatnot. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and so when COVID hit, I was sitting here, I was no longer filming. Um, we had all this content and I was just like, what are we about to do now? And that's what, that's what happens a lot as the leader of this, this ragtag bunch of misfits is that a lot of people just call me up constantly just be like, man, what are we about to do? Uh, are we done? Are we still going? And I'm like, it's too big. It moves without us. We can't stop going, but we couldn't <laughs> film. We could not film. And so it was like, all right, here I am. I have all, I just, literally built this garage into a studio can't invite anybody over <laughs> we have no more podcasts what are we about to do and so all of a sudden i was like well we're just going to take two weeks off everybody this is not going to last longer than two weeks that's what i told everybody <laughs> i was like we're going to take two weeks off i'll come up with a plan and during that plan i had you know just you know how like you look over at the big boy, so to speak, and, and like things happen, and you just go, man, I, I wish I could do something like that. Well, Disney Plus dropped. And when Disney Plus dropped, many people don't remember it now, but it like that first couple of days was rocky. It was crashing all the time. People couldn't sign in, but they did it. And I was so happy about, about being able to see DuckTales and Darkwing Duck and all the different things that I, I didn't care about the experience. I was just so freaking pleased that I was just like, man, if only I can do something like that. And so I did, I, I made APR TV because I was like, well, I'm going to fail in front of everybody. And you know, who, who's going to what? a hundred people might download it at all, whatever. Right. And so I just kept doing that and we kept uploading. And as of you know, today we have 870 different episodes up there, thousands of hours of content at this point. Um, all these people that I met on during the the pandemic, I would look on on the different uh, YouTube channels, Instagram feeds, everything else, and I was just looking for who else was still trying to hustle during the pandemic. That was the that was your only qualifier. I was like, no, you don't have to pay anything to be on the network. You don't have to do anything. If you're hustling during the pandemic, I want your content on the channel. And all of a sudden, I had like 30 people now who are all on the channel, all producing. Whether I do anything or not, they're all producing as we speak. And... All of a sudden, I was like, all right, well, nobody needs me to film anymore. I just need to just collect shows as they are made. Well, what do I get to make anymore? And then my brother, Oliver Banks of Art Monkey Animation, um, he was like, hey, I have these. Uh, he was he, he did a post of like a collage of all these little loops that he has. And I was like, eh, you got any loops that are above five to seven seconds? And he was like, yeah, I got a lot of them. And so he gave them to me <laughs> like in his, and I don't know, like Oliver's always been like that with me. He's just like, here, see if you can do something with it. So I made art monkey anime, um, art monkey radio, which was basically those lo-fi loops, animation loops. And I just started putting music to it. So all of the old music that I have is on an art monkey radio. All the lo-fi stuff is out there now. Um, all the up and coming artists are now up there because there was no place for me to go. There was no place for me to do stuff. Like when I was like a young kid saying, I want to go to an open mic, I had to look up what an, where an open mic would be at. And hopefully it would be someplace that I knew and understood. Well, like I am the open mic because <laughs> we have a music showcase now in which like you come on by and we're going to expand that to where it's going to be more up and comers. Cause like my whole thing is, is that with the philosophy of always press record, right? It's that everything is worth being recorded. 
Like, if we want to format it or change it or do it, something like that, we can do that in post. But everything should be recorded and and valued. And that was kind of how we evolved from me doing one podcast, making mistakes in front of everybody. So now we're a network with coffee mugs and stuff like that that doesn't make sense, but it, it, it all works because... Um, a lot of people enjoy being on the network. It means a lot to them now. Um, and I, I'm always just trying to be that last push, man. Because you never know who people might be. You never know. You never know what it might involve to. And I've involved them to me <laughs> with all the different pushes that I have along the way that where I was got, I was able to explore the creativity to where now if somebody needs a theme song for a He-Man Kickstarter, then guess what? I got one in the tuck. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, like I, I understand more about it. I'm a well-rounded artist. I wanted to be a Renaissance man. My mom told me not to be, a, to, to never be a, a jack of all trades, master of none. But now I believe that I'm a fully fledged artist. That's what I, that's what I call myself. And so it's like, yeah, like a lot of us, a lot of us within the company, they're like, what's next? And we have the podcast thing. We understand the podcast thing. We understand the beauty of it and why it's important. But um, I want to kind of conquer a few more things. Because I, I want to bring more and more people uh, to to the platform. I love HBO, man. Like, I love HBO so much I'll get a tattoo of the old school logo. Because it was like, you couldn't find anything there. Like, like I remember this show called Dream On. It was back when, yeah. it was right after Sex in the City. It was, it, was, was it? it was in that block. Yeah, it was in that 30 minute block. Um, and the great thing about Dream On, uh, not only was it a little risque for a young kid like me, <laughs> but it was, uh, he had splice backs, uh, like just like these clips that were just spliced in as a storytelling device of old clips from movies and TV shows and things like that. I don't know why it's still ingrained in my head, but it's like, like I see with the music, I see with all of it, I see with how I do art still to this day with on the network that like I'm that guy over splicing in all these reference points from TV past <laughs> and like trying to make it into something new for for people who don't know. And that's one of the greatest things of, that having young kids have shown me is that they just have no clue what I know of as cool and awesome they have no cool no clue and so i get to be that cool person to pass it on right and go yeah and you should you think that's cool let me show you this <laughs> and then like all of a sudden they go oh how did you know about that well i was there man i was there i was there man <laughs> and that's where it's at so it's like you know always press record is really if my kid didn't have APR kids, I don't know if it would be as big as it is or I would have devoted as much time to it. But somewhere along the way, I saw that my kid likes to do the stuff I do. And so maybe this might be his thing. And, you know, like, I don't know. If you would have told me that we would still be doing this four years later, I would have said, you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even... I hadn't picked up a guitar five years ago. I hadn't picked up a guitar in like so many years to where my kids didn't even know I played. Like, how weird is that? <laughs> and it's yeah. like, yeah, like my, my, my kid's nine years old and he's very, basically you probably see me play guitar maybe three times. And I have seven of them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like one of those things where, I've gotten to do the art thing, man. And I just want to be that guy for somebody else. Man, there's going to be an artist that comes through to where he'll go, man, you remember that Trey guy? <laughs> and, and I want to be that old dude that they just mention every once in a while. Just like <laughs> I, there's somebody like that for me. 
because like you know why would i and i played harmonica and acoustic guitar <laughs> like w that doesn't even sound anything like me but for for that one brief moment in my lifetime that was that was the release that so many people are looking for so many people are looking for it. I mean, you grew up in the 90s. We all had a lot of guitar and a harmonica. There was like... A lot of harmonica. That was just what we had, right? It's not... It was just your childhood. I think so. I think it's weirder for me because nobody else was doing it. And so, sure. like, whenever I was around, everybody was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah, there seemed to be quite a backlash for you. You're like, hey, I it like is. this stuff. And everyone's like, why do you like that stuff? No, I my, my <laughs> best friend has said that, is that one of the greatest things about being a spectator to this journey, because, like, you know, he's he's been my road manager. He's been my best friend. He's the guy, godfather to both my kids. He's seen where, like, I didn't know how to play guitar, and then one day I was, and then one day I was making money from it, right? And then... He's just amazed by like the people that surround me that will say no, or that's not good, or that you shouldn't try that. Why are you trying that? And it's like, so each time I'm like always the, on, the only person in the room where it's like, I'm doing something. Like being around you and Chris, like y'all, y'all do the same thing I do. But I remember when I told everybody, I'm going to be a podcast producer. And I said it just like that. I mean, everybody was like, what's a podcast? One. And then two, you're going to produce podcasts? And I was like, I'm going to be a podcast producer. And then, like, within two to three years, <laughs> somebody just started calling me trade a producer. And I was like, oh, I like that. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to start telling other people that's my name. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's, I think for me, because I always say, yeah, there wasn't the support. And so, yeah, there, there is a backlash. A lot of the times I brace myself for it. Um, especially right now we're doing a Kickstarter PSA and we were going over the, the first script. And it's very interesting to me because, um, me being so open and honest and like, I really do believe all lives matter. <laughs> and so when we were over doing the kick, the Kickstarter PSA, well, like, it was very important to black He-Man to say that black, that they, to include the word black, that all black heroes matter. And I was just like, yeah, but you don't really need to do that. But like, you know, if that's what you feel like, then go on ahead, whatever, man. Who am I to tell you wrong? And then it's like, I was looking over at other people, man, and they, their identities are totally different than mine. <laughs> My identity has nothing to do with just me being black because for me it's always like man yeah i'm black that's cool but did you see that i did this with this paint or i did this with this film or I, there's so many other things that i want other people to recognize that that's always been my drive and it's like no recognize that this is cool and they're like no it's not cool and i'm like why is it not cool well that person when he did it is cool but it's not cool when i did it and it's like yeah and so it's like a lot of the time I had to like, you know, puff out the chest and we're going to go like, we're going to play this song. We're going to play this, this song, man. The first time. All right. So this is the reason why I'm never, ever scared on stage is because I was on stage once. Right. And it was, uh, it was in a town in between here in El Paso, not really a small town, but it was like, you know, uh, it was one of those where the bar booked me. And so we were going to drive there. And so I went on up there, man. This is during the time of the Bush administration. And uh, and I was, you know, I was in my political bag, man. Because, like, you know, I'm I'm the next Bob Dylan. I'm the black Bob Dylan and shit. And so <laughs> I go on over there and I got really stammed offish. And I made this, I, I played this song called No News is Good News. And not only did I get booed, like booed horribly, horribly, horribly. I have never seen, like, if I would have ever got cheered as loud as I got booed, I think that I would be better off in life, but I got booed really, really hard. And before I knew it, 
I turned around to go look over at my drummer because I was like, man, fuck it. Let's just let's just take it up a notch. It was like really antagonizing because when I turned back around, the guy punched me dead in the face. Some dude punched me dead in the face. Like, how do you one? How do you get that close to the stage? Two, how do you get up there? And three, you punched me in the face dude, over a song. <laughs> and that's when I understood that uh i have the artistic power to evoke emotion to evoke <laughs> thought to evoke a lot of different things that like i'm not always privy to right because i'm the guy holding the brush i'm yeah. the guy doing it all right and yeah. so it's like that perspective and reference point right that's where it comes up again right oh um, has taught me that I got to be careful when I bring on a new person. Um, I let go of people off of the roster for being too risque because, no, it should be something that anybody can can appreciate and consume, right, as the network guy, right, because mm-hmm. I'm the network guy. I'm not just, you know, your podcast guy. I'm, I, I got to think about everybody. So for me my identity now is the conglomerate it's not just my art right it's not just my perspective it's not just what i like it's what everybody likes we have the latino conservative i'm not conservative i am not latino but he is and that's his point of view but he exists on my on my network because i love him he's my brother and he's gonna he's gonna have a spot to spout off his stuff, whatever he needs to do within reason, right? Within reason. But APR became that place where if you knew me and you said, Hey, I need a safe spot, <laughs> then you got a safe space. And that's what it's kind of grown into. And then all of a sudden we have so much content. Um we're over here looking to change up our live streams because more people are watching. I'm surprised by it. I'm surprised by a lot of the, um, I hate to say it's success, but it is. Um, because now people are watching us globally. We've hit 2000 people, like, you know what I mean? On the app. So like, obviously when like we upload the numbers speak for themselves and they, they show that people are pushing play. Yeah. So we got to just keep going, right? We can't stop the, the, the boat. We can't turn it around, at least. But it is, um, it is becoming interesting because now where I took amateurs in the beginning, everybody's groomed. Everybody's ready. Everybody wants to take the next step. It's very, very interesting to me now that I get calls about rebranding and elevating the presentation now when it used to be like you have to have an intro you have to have the apr logo on the outro you have to do now they know now they understand now everybody's trying to be a millionaire right and so it's like it's elevated the whole entire thing and it is it's you would have told me always press record would be <laughs> anything more than um than just a phrase that we said as a joke because it was an inside joke (laughs) because a lot of times I just didn't I didn't remember to press record and it was like should press record (laughs) and so it was an inside joke and now we have the the phrase trademark and slapped on everything so strange journey man it's interesting that's the thing it's interesting to think about this point in your development and this idea of what is next because in the podcast world there is not a clear path right Mm -hmm. like we were talking earlier about like television and like oh how do they pitch ideas and how do they get funding from the canadian government and Mm -hmm. we don't know how that works but that works some way we just don't know what it is podcasting Mm -hmm. is so new it's such a brand new sort of landscape that there is there's like a clear path for celebrity podcasts but there isn't really a clear path for 
non-celebrity podcasts, right? And there's millions of them at this point. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. one thing that you mentioned a moment ago when you were talking about your like aggregating of like artists and whatnot, mm -hmm. how at first you were kind of censoring and now you're like trying to just be like, hey, it's okay if everybody's different and you're doing different things, just make sure it's at an elevated level. Like, yes. I, as whatever you're doing, and not everything has to be, you know, all, you know, liberal or yeah. all conservative or all music or all whatever, mm -hmm. but you have to make sure that you're doing it solidly. And I think that yes. one of the keys to why podcasting is great and I still don't like know what the next step is like in a large sense, because like, I really just don't think it's been invented for non famous people. So we mm. have to invent it. But mm -hmm. I do think that there's something great about the niche um, ideas like these podcasts that are super specific, that are just for a certain group. Right. And, yeah. you know, you talked earlier about how it's like, it's really hard to, when you're making art, when you're trying to create something of your own, you know, this is the way that I creatively flow. This is what's going on. How can I make it so that a, the largest audience likes it? Well, you can't, but you can definitely make it so a small group likes it. Yes. Right? So if you have a super specific pointed idea of who it is you're making it for, you can. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why podcasting, successful podcasts, have done so well, right? There are certain people that are into certain kinds of things. You know, like um, like the boon of true crime. People are mm -hmm. obsessed with that. They're like yeah. so super, super into it, right? People have been into true crime shows for years, right? Especially yeah. our generation. Again, Generation mm -hmm. X we were raised on America's Most Wanted. We were raised murder on like cops. Like, yeah, yeah, Murder, She Wrote. Yeah, those are great examples. These are great, three great examples because they represent different styles of true yes. crime, right? Yes. The first two cops and America's Most Wanted are, this is a real thing that happened in the real world. We mm -hmm. are now trying to solve it, help us solve it, right? People love mm -hmm. help it, solving it. Yeah. Then Murder, She Wrote, totally fictionalized, written, mm -hmm. But you're mm -hmm. still, while you're watching it, trying to figure it out, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so all we want to do is solve a mystery, right? Like, as people watching this, we want to solve this mystery. So true crime is a hit because it gives us a sort of tangible, potentially answerable mystery that we can, like, wrap our minds around. And if the storyteller does it well enough, as the first... The first true crime podcast that really kicked off all podcasts was Serial, Serial right? Yeah. And the way they told it was the key. Like, yeah, I was like, so you I could do a whole, you could create a podcasting program at a university just by analyzing that show. I, I, very much so to where I, I think it's, I think it's a disservice for how much I've been in the game and I have not consumed it. I was not <laughs> part of that boom. Um, yeah, but that, that's the other thing that's, like, yeah. great is that, like, that kicked it off. Also, mm -hmm. P.S., I'm personally not super into true crime. Weirdly, since I had children, I've all of a sudden become a little bit more concerned about the fact that it seems that people love murdering each other. What's, hold yeah, on. Really hey, hey. <laughs> hey, why do we have to, let's, uh, sh let's not talk about that for a while. My boy doesn't need to know everyone's just murdering each other for a while, okay? For so, yeah, while. I'm not personally personally into true crime personally but am i aware that it's like a hugely popular thing in podcasting yeah totally absolutely if i could stomach talking about true crime oh my god i would totally have a podcast about it because it's the thing but that's not what i'm into and the key of niche stuff is doing something that you are into the thing that jives with you so that when you talk about it it's like you are just so excited about it. You're like, oh, creativity. Like, like that's why. So this podcast that we are actively yeah. doing right now mm -hmm. about creativity, right? And like all mm -hmm. this art talk that we've had, yeah. it's great. And you know why yeah. it's great? Because the people who listen to this podcast are also artists who are going to be like, huh, that is an interesting way to think about art. And oh, man, I have been trying to work on this mm -hmm. because they're in it. The people who this is going to go out to are the people who want to create stuff, right? Like, 
you know, we can discuss how it's working. Everyone that's listening is also trying to figure out how it's working. Man, when I create art, I think this, man, I wish I could reach a larger audience. What he said makes so much sense to me, right? Yeah. That's the key is like finding who it is that you want to tell your stories to and then just tell it to them. The interesting part about that is about what you're saying is that it's absolutely true. And I think <laughs> that if, if, if it wasn't for my exposure reference points once again so my first real podcast consumption like you know like i'm binging this podcast i a new one came out oh that type of stuff was all kevin smith and his original smart castle which was his podcast company that all of his friends were part of so here I am with said company, right? Like we talked to Ming Chen, he's still doing it out there, but yeah. it's like I myself, um, seeing Kevin Smith just take all of his friends who, who were all in his movies and stuff like that. That's kind of who I've been. I didn't realize I was emulating that, but I realized very much so that I, that was my hero in this game. That was my first podcast like my reference point for podcasts like for the guy who started this whole thing with me his reference points was a rapper the ex-rapper who was a podcaster for me it was kevin smith so it was like of course i want multiple podcasts and i want all my friends to have a podcast and i want us all to be under one podcast umbrella because i wanted to have like that kevin smith friendly <laughs> vibe right because that's all i knew about podcasting that's what you do right Neither, man, I had no idea that people only have one podcast and it's always serious and that <laughs> there's a formality to it and there's topics. What Kevin Smith said on one of his podcasts, and it's really one of the originals that he started, um, that still goes on every once in a while, was like him and his his producer, his movie producer. They would just, you know have conversations and talk about silly things like in Canadian news and stuff like that. Right. But that's what they did to just hang out with each other because Kevin Smith said, all you need is just three topics to talk about and just start going and a good friend. And so he, he said that and I was like, Oh, so we just need to have at least three topics in case all hell breaks loose and nobody knows what to talk about. And then we keep going. So I just started making podcasts like that, man. It was like everything can be a podcast because somebody told me that. Somebody was like, anything can be a podcast. And I was like, all right, so let's take this guy who likes to do sports radio but can't do sports radio anymore. Let's put him on our stuff. And so Big Star Sports became that dude. And so we started getting interviews from different places, started being able to go behind the scenes and into locker rooms. And then we had a sports division. I was like, oh, was, wow, wow. Uh, all right, well then I don't I don't really want to talk about sports, but you can talk about sports and anybody who wants to talk about sports can now go over there. And it's like anybody who wants to talk about activism, you can go over there with the mangrove community because I don't I don't want to talk about politics all the time. Does anybody want to talk about silly movies? Because that's what I want to talk about. I want to do like a mystery science three uh, three thousand type of thing where we just talk about how stupid things are in the movies or how they could have done this better or that better. Cause that's fun for me, but believe it or not, I don't have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're too busy making other people do it. You're too busy inspiring other part. people and getting them and, and working them. And then, you know, your actual life and job. So, you know, you got a couple of things going on. <laughs> It's one of those things that a lot of people bring up because they go, oh, because like, you know, I always talk about always press record. I always talk about APR, APR TV. Like, you know, like you hang around, you just hear these things constantly. And then somebody will, new will come up and be like, oh, well, what's your podcast? And I'll be like, I don't have one. And they go, but well, you're always talking about podcasts. And I was like, yeah, yeah that's cool. <laughs> but I don't have one. I don't have one weekly because I did it and I understood it. Um, and so I help other people do it and they enjoy that part. And I enjoy the other part, which is like making it packaged and, and worth it and easy to cons be consumed. That's the thing for me is that I, I want people to enjoy the consumption, believe it or not, as you can imagine. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, I feel like most of what we've talked about during the course of this podcast has been like how to connect with audiences and like, you know, mm -hmm. different ways to look at what audiences are and like how to, whether you're trying to get, you know, a national audience or an international audience, or are you trying to get like a certain specific, you know, group of people that have a specific interest right they're like super into you know shipwrecks from like 1780 mm -hmm. to 1863 and if you want to talk about that those guys they're into it right like yeah. so so there's i feel like that's been a, a theme in a lot of what we've talked about and i think that the search for who your audience is and how you connect with them is an age old artist problem. I think mm -hmm. even to harken back to what we were talking about way earlier with the like, you know, Renaissance painters and how like they didn't get any respect during their time. Like they're out there making stuff. Was it worthless? No, it is not mm -hmm. worthless because now we are like, man, look at this. This is amazing. Right. I mean, like my favorite painter to go see in museums is Jackson Pollock. Was that guy kind of a piece of shit? Yeah, yeah, he totally was. I would not want to be his friend. He would be canceled immediately right now. But something about that splatter painting and the fact that they're like huge paintings. I love it. I love it. I could stand there and stare at them for hours. And I don't know I why. I didn't I understand Pollock for a long time. Yeah. I didn't understand because... Everybody was talking about Basquiat, right? Which, like, was my introduction, of course, because I always have the black door open. And then, like, I started seeing, okay, what else is around here? And so, like, when I saw Pollock, I didn't understand because I was like, all right, but that's, he's just splattering paint, right? But then, like, when you actually see one in person and see the signs of the splatter and realize that, oh, that's kind of controlled. <laughs> not only is that control that was intentional bro and so it's it's it's, it's an appreciation to it um like i said like art's intimidating for people whether they yeah. like to admit it or not and but everything can be art and i think that's what kind of just messes up non-art people as we were saying that like not everybody yeah. wants to be in front of the canvas or wants to be the person who said i made this you know even though I love doing that, man. I love going like this. <laughs> like, oh, absolutely. It. You tell me, you you know, can I have a little attention? I'll take it. Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> please. Trey, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you talking to me. I feel like we, like, totally jumped right in and didn't, there was no preamble. I'm going to have to tell you all my business after. <laughs> but we just, like, super got into our creativity talk, like, so mm -hmm. organically that I was like, oh, this is it. We are flowing. This is happening. So yeah. thank you for sharing with me all of your, you know, theories on creativity and, and stories from your own journey. Man, I hope that uh, something was of worth that was said. Um <sighs> Uh, it's all from experience and so uh hopefully hopefully other people as they go through the same footsteps will avoid a few <laughs> or embrace a few because that's the thing man this is it's, it's a long journey it's a long journey on this one yeah it's a long journey to episode 100 <laughs> which I is what everybody should be trying to go to yeah, yeah. I mean, at least, like I said, you're gonna be two seventy eight. So, uh, so sometimes you move past a hundred, right? In yeah. fact, I would say that this podcast from episode a hundred through mm -hmm. to now has evolved and changed into something that's a little different than it originally was, and that that, like that is something that is to be appreciated about the art of it to begin with right like how it developed over time even you know even my own interviewing style yeah. you know the ability to ask the right questions or lead the conversation in another way you know you have to allow yourself the time to do some trial and error before you know you can I feel like art's always evolving. So, you know, you learn stuff, you move forward, it develops, then it becomes something different. Like, 
it's it's a it's a long journey like you're saying uh, yeah i'm uh, for me even though there's four years to our collective history there are seasons whenever the pressure would be too hard or heavy or there would be a big change in the roster or something behind the scenes it would be a new season of, of APR and so we're actually technically on season six so hearing that from a hundred on it changed yeah because yeah. after those first hundred on the network things changed and then it changed again every single time to where there were different seasons and each season you got better uh it was a little more honed in to where like like I say now like it doesn't need me anymore but like at each one of those were like some milestones <laughs> there was yeah. some milestones there might have been some uh some tears and some doubts because that's what happens along the way yeah uh, lots of tears and doubts well it's, it's not natural it's not natural to be on stage no matter what you say and so a lot of what? people will doubt themselves from time to time but you know what i no longer it, i no longer avoid the doubts i embrace them because that means that i still care and as long as I'm still, still trying to impress somebody, still trying to like get that next viewer, that next subscription or whatever it is, then like, I'm still going to do this. But yeah. there's uh there's some, there's some quiet moments. I'll say that <laughs> to every moment of creativity, there's some quiet moments. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Yes But Why Podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.